Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're tuning in today around the world. My name is John Allen. I'm the president of the Brookings Institution, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Asia Transnational Threats Forum, Cybersecurity and Cyber Resilience. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the first to thank uh, the Korea Foundation for their generous support in making this event possible. Their partnership with us has been long and productive and continues to be invaluable uh, to our research on all things related to the peninsula. Today's conference is the fourth iteration of the Asia Transnational Threats Forum, or ATTF as it's called. And this series has been very important to so many of us. Since its launch by our Center for East Asia Policy Studies in 2018, the ATTF has convened to examine strategic challenges affecting all of Asia, including counterterrorism and climate change. This year, the focus will be on cybersecurity issues in Asia and the impact of digital technologies on regional security, economics, and political dynamics. Moderated by Brookings Senior Fellow and SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korean Studies, Jung Pak. We are excited to have a distinguished lineup of experts from across the Pacific uh, who, will who will present the dis and discuss the current cyber threat environment and the cybersecurity ecosystem in the region. So to kick off the event, uh, we're especially honored to welcome Ambassador Jong In Bae of the Republic of Korea. Since joining the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1992, Ambassador Bay has served overseas in various roles in Northeast Asia, North America, and Africa, including Deputy Director General of Northeast Asian Affairs Bureau. In his current capacity as the Ambassador for International Security Affairs, Ambassador Bay has been leading the ministry's efforts to coordinate the international partners on responses to cyber incidents and cyber crime investigations since January of this year. Among his many responsibilities, he has also remained a crucial voice on issues related to cybersecurity as well as counterterrorism. Welcome, Ambassador. It is great uh, to have you with us and a pleasure and an honor that you could join us today for this crucial conversation. But before I turn the floor over to Ambassador Bay for his keynote remarks, a brief reminder that we're very much on the record today and we're streaming live and you can submit your questions to events at Brookings dot edu that's events at brookings dot edu or on twitter using hashtag attf cyber hashtag attf cyber so with that thank you again for joining us today and ambassador thank you for your commitment and service to your country your friendship to all of us and for your engaging with us today in this important forum sir the floor is yours thank you Thank you. Uh, it is an honor to be invited to this webinar, and I'm glad to share our cybersecurity policy and experience. I'd like to thank Mr. John Allen, uh, the president of the Brookings, and Dr. Chang Park. As one of the most wired countries in the world, the Republic of Korea has been exposed to significant cyber intrusions in the past, from the DDoS attack in 2009, to the Korea hydro and nuclear power hack in 2014, to the WannaCry ransomware attack 2017, which all served as a wake up calls. Yet the landscape is constantly shifting. If I take a snapshot of the current state, first, the financial sector has emerged as a major target of malicious acts, especially numerous hacking accidents of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges have taken place with considerable monetary laws. Second, complex spear phishing emails have become a matter of everyday occurrence to government officials in charge of national security and foreign affairs. We have learned only in hindsight that large scale attacks often had stemmed from seemingly minor human errors resulting from social engineering. Third, the Internet of Things and AI enabled devices are significantly expanding the threat surface. Experts are wary of an eventuality of massive cyber attacks through IoT devices and urge a state of preparedness by employing, for instance, scenario based exercises. From a broader regional perspective, the picture appears somewhat similar. 
the latest evaluations of Interpol and FireEye indicate that ASEAN and Asia Pacific regions face phishing campaigns, banking malware, and ransomware attacks. Another dynamic in play is the pandemic. COVID-19 has accelerated the speed of integrating our daily lives into cyberspace, compelling us to try to rely more on ICT. And malicious actors are obviously taking advantage of the increased vulnerabilities. Let me now turn to how Korea is responding, first at the domestic level and then to international engagement. To consistently address ever more serious cyber threats, the government mapped out a national cybersecurity strategy last year. Uh, this strategy has translated into 100 specific tasks with a fixed time frame. Its holistic approach incorporates the protection of individual rights and the private sector's participation in delivering those tasks. In terms of structure and governance, we now have the presidential office as a control tower in policy coordination and in handling cyber incidents. And each relevant department is taking a lead role. The National Cybersecurity Center for the Public Sector, the Minister of Science for the Private Sector, and the Minister of Defense for the Military Sector. The protection of critical infrastructure has been our primary concern. We have designated over 400 facilities as critical infrastructure and supervise them among other things by undergo, undertaking annual vulnerability assessments. Cybersecurity is a, of course a matter beyond the national boundary. Our international engagement policy emphasizes contribution to global rulemaking, active engagement in trust building and support for capacity building. Let me start with the rulemaking. To promote a rule-based order in cyberspace, Korea is actively participating in the UN Working Group in close coordination with the US and other like-minded countries. We believe that the current system of international law, including the UN Charter, is applicable to states' conduct in cyberspace. There are some gaps in its interpretation. For instance, we do not have consensus on what amounts to an armed attack in cyberspace. But the best way to address these gaps is to seek a shared understanding of international law rather than start uh, negotiating a new treaty. And all states appear to uphold rule-based order in cyberspace. Yet the ultimate question for many small and middle-sized countries would be, how effective are those norms in protecting them from cyber threats? With that perspective in mind, we advocate the duty of due diligence whereby a state should remain vigilant so malicious actors cannot exploit its territory to harm others. And a confidence building measure is another critical element in enhancing the transparency and stability of cyberspace. At the bilateral level, we have had a cyber consultation with the partners, uh, including the US. Korea is also engaging in trilateral consultation with its, its immediate neighbors, Japan and China. We are also participating in the ARF intercessional meetings on ICT security at the regional level. And one last building block of international cooperation is capacity building for other countries. The COVID-19 pandemic made us realize that no country is safe until all countries are safe. Korea and the US, for instance, held a consultation recently to explore any convergence between Korea's new Southern policy and the US's Indo-Pacific strategy in terms of how we can build a capacity building uh, of cybersecurity in this region. With this kind of linking, we can avoid redundancies and enhance the efficacy of our programs. South Korea, I believe, has comparative strength in cyber crime investigation and forensic. As such, we have helped Bangladesh and Sri Lanka build a cyber investigation center and are working now with uh, Indonesia on building our, their cyber forensic capacity. Between states, we, I think we have to have uh, multiple layers of cooperation in emergency response, information sharing, diplomacy, defense, and law enforcement. But as the line between cyber crime and cyber attack is sometimes being blurred, cooperation among law enforcement agencies is becoming 
more important in shaping those malicious actors calculation of cost and benefit. Up to now, I have discussed the cyber threat landscape and how Korea is responding to the challenge at the domestic and international level together with the like-minded countries. We recognize that norms, CBMs, and capacity building measures should develop hand in hand to create a virtuous circle. Again, our priority has to be on their implementation, putting all three of them into practice. We must yet admit that technology is outpacing policy and rulemaking. We have uh, demanding challenges related to coping with uh, emergency, emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, and other new technology amplify the dangers of malicious cyber activities. Various forms of cyber attacks coupled with uh, disinformation present another pitfall. Targets are constantly changing and from banks to cryptocurrencies and now also to medical facilities. And most of all, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of our multilateral system. While our resources are being redirected and exhausted because of the pandemic, cyber threat continue to evolve with ever increasing sophistication and audacity. To address these challenges, uh, resilience in isolation will not be enough. We need to step up bilateral, regional, and interregional cooperation, not just for strategic discussions, but also for practical measures and implementation. Another lesson from the pandemic is that public-private Partnerships are vital in our fight against the virus. Uh, analogies are often drawn between disease control and cybersecurity. And we do not have a global CDC for cybersecurity now. And at the moment, it sounds uh, like a distant future. But in terms of rulemaking, consensus making, and international cooperation, the multi stakeholder approach is instrumental. And I believe this is the only viable path to achieving effective public hygiene in cyberspace. In, the, in that regard too, I appreciate the Brookings Institution's efforts to raise awareness and bring us together uh, with this webinar. I thank you for your attention. Ambassador Bay, that was a fascinating uh, discussion about, about what South Korea is doing and how you see the landscape of, of cybersecurity. Um, you know, I wanted to spend the next few minutes to talk about um, what South Korea has done. Um, and you've made this reference between this very interesting comparison between cybersecurity and global health security about the cyber, pen, you know, uh, uh, CDC for cybersecurity uh, as, as much as we do for um, pandemics. Um, South Korea has shown how digital technologies can be successfully used to track cases to contain and treat the coronavirus but this has justifiably raised questions about privacy and civil liberties. Um, what are one or two key actions that we need to take to ensure against the abuse of digital technologies and protect individual rights during public health emergencies? Uh, thank you for your question. Korea experienced the MERS outbreak in 2015 and we learned some lessons at that time and we enacted the law to allow health authorities to collect and disclose certain data under limited situation to make sure the public's right to know. And this time in our fight against COVID-19, Korea has carried out three T's, testing, tracing, and treatment with a commitment to openness, transparency, and civic participation. We could resort to the, this previous law, but only in accordance with that law and with the safe, appropriate safeguards. The premise was of course that the government did its best to win trust with the full transparency to fulfill the citizens' right to know about every aspect of the spreading disease and government action. Still in doing so, we seek to make an improvement. To address privacy concern, the Korea Disease Control Agency has established specific guidelines on time frame and scope of publicly accessible information to ensure the necessity and proportionality of those measures. And also the Personal Information Protection Commission announced a strengthened guideline in September for COVID-19 related personal information and is making continuous effort to improve and implement these guidelines for protection of privacy. Likewise, I think it is important to have these safeguards in place under the rule of law and also to have open discussion on how to balance between public safety and privacy 
from the perspective of democracy and human rights. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to pivot a little bit. Um, you talked about how the cyber, how policy is, is going to be constantly outpaced by the technology. Um, and, you know, I wanted to ask about, you know, uh, that ultimately it's people who are developing these technologies um, and it's people who are the first line of defense uh, when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, how do we make sure that we're giving the next generation experts the right training to tackle these quickly evolving cybersecurity challenges? It's like anybody else, it's our priority to foster a manpower for cybersecurity. And this is a long-term project and requires conscious and continuous efforts on the part of both government and private sector. And at the moment, uh, Korea has more than 160 universities and other institutes that have uh, departments of cybersecurity. I think where about 9,000 students are enrolled. And we are supporting these programs, for instance, by designating some of them as a specialized institute of cybersecurity, and also by encouraging to study the so-called convergence issues uh, like smart city, smart factory, and other IoT enabled project. We are also working on the program of the next generation security leaders to find and foster talented young people in this field, even in high school. And for cybersecurity, I think the next generation might be too late. Uh, we need to mainstream this issue with a lifelong education and training. And Korea, for instance, designates uh, every July as the month of cybersecurity and holds various events to raise public awareness of cybersecurity. And I believe this is ultimately an issue of investment for the future. Thank you. Ambassador Bay, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your, and your experience. Um, this is a great way to kick off our event. Um, Ambassador, thank you for joining us. I know it's very late um, in, in Korea where you are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, without further ado, we'll jump right into our uh, panel discussion. Um, as Ambassador Bay noted, um, Asian countries' success with tackling the public health crisis has shown how Asia Pacific is at the, at the forefront of digital technology development and its population is highly connected and digitally savvy. Yet, as the pandemic has shown our dependence on the internet, it has also exposed our vulnerabilities. Moreover, the quickly evolving cyber landscape has been made more fraught by an increase in cyber criminal activity as the pandemic has expanded the attack surface and the growing importance of cyber capabilities as instruments of national power and statecraft. To cover how the region is navigating these issues, I am very pleased to be joined by a panel of distinguished experts. We have Thomas Uren, Senior Analyst at the International Cyber Policy Center, Australian Strategic Policy Institute. I think it's around uh, a little past midnight there, uh, Thomas. Um, Elena Noor, Director of the Political Security Affairs at the Asia Society Policy Institute here in Washington, DC. And Mihoko Matsubara, the Chief Cybersecurity Strategist at NTT Corporation. Thank you all of you for, for joining, joining us. I know it's very late in Australia and very late in Japan. Um, so I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of, of your time. Um, Tom, I wanna turn to you first. Um, can you ta talk to us about what are the drivers of malicious cyber activities in the region? Um, what specific actions is Canberra taking to counter them? And can you offer three or four key takeaways from Australia's experience? Yeah, so thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and it's late, but I'm excited to be talking about cybersecurity as usual. And so your first question, what are the drivers? Um, it works, or at least people think it works. So, uh, you know, in the Indo-Pacific, the countries I think of that have engaged in a lot of cyber activity, uh, North Korea, the People's Republic of China, and I'm going to stick Russia in there because of Vladivostok, um, just so I've got a bit more to talk about, and, and also the US. Um, so North Korea, uh, the ambassador spoke about raising uh, money being stolen. And so this is one of North Korea's strategic goals. They want to get hard currency. They're using cyber operations to steal money. So both real money from banks, but also money from cryptocurrency exchanges. And South Korea has definitely been a big target. So it's, you know, one of their strategic goals. Um, 
the PRC, uh, one example is their goal to uh, promote their own manufacturing industries and advance manufacturing, the Made in China 2025 initiative. And cyber espionage has been used to steal a lot of um, intellectual property. So that's not the only way that they do it, but it's part of that initiative. So it's contributing directly to their strategic goals. Uh, Russia, similarly, it's used a lot of cyber operations that it thinks are helping it out. So for example, um, part of their, their state operations has been a state um, doping program for their athletes. And they've used a lot of cyber operations to um, not justify it, but to when that doping program was discovered to try and undermine what other, other countries had done. So to, to make everyone else look bad. Uh, I mean, famously, they, they disrupted the US election last time, 2016, and no doubt they're trying again. So they're, they're using cyber operations for their strategic goals. Uh, I mentioned the US. Uh, they've behaved quite differently in that they're relatively transparent about what they're trying to do and they're trying to demonstrate that you can use cyber operations in a responsible way. So they're a bit different from the other three actors I've spoken about. Uh, so it works. So what has the Australian government done about it? Um, I think it's important to note that this is taking place in a context of quite a lot of foreign interference in Australia. Um, so the Department of Home Affairs talks about democratic institutions, education and research institutions, media and communications, uh, diaspora communities and critical infrastructure. So that's, you know, almost everything. And cyber operations are one way that other countries can uh, try and gain some advantage. Um, so Australia's taken other actions against foreign interference. The cybersecurity parts, we've had a cybersecurity strategy since 2016. Um, so that's four years now. Uh, at the time, there was a special advisor to the PM. And uh, one of the important things was a cyber ambassador. Um, and the cyber ambassador went around particularly Southeast Asia and promoted uh, responsible behavior. We've been relatively transparent in the region, not as transparent as the US, but more so than many other countries about what that might mean. And uh, so, you know, following the rule of law, um, proportional, you know, necessity, uh, try and limit collateral damage, those kinds of things, and also an education program uh, in the region around the UN uh, group of governmental experts norms. Um, there's many other things that are in the strategy that you would kind of expect to be in a government strategy. I'll just pull out a few things that are maybe somewhat different to Australia. Um, in 2017, the government announced that the, the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian equivalent of the National Security Agency, would use offensive cyber capabilities against offshore cyber criminals. So I think this is somewhat unusual in that most countries, maybe they do it, but they don't publicly announce that they do it. Uh, and it's almost somewhat at odds against the uh, the international law legal use of force in that if it's a law enforcement issue, it, it really should be up to individual states. But Australia's tried to, it, that's actually in legislation that it's got that role. And um, I think what the government was trying to do was deter cyber criminals by saying, um, we, we've got a national authority that will come after you. Uh, that's been reiterated during COVID-19 and in the 2020 update, the government announced a whole lot of extra money for the police, uh, the Australian Federal Police to basically enable um, them to understand criminal targets and be able to do something about them. So the police don't have a hands-on role, but they'll do the sort of background investigative work to find out who and, and where to attack. 
And when I say offensive cyber, I mean to disrupt, essentially. Um, one other unusual thing is that the Prime Minister gave a press conference in June this year where he announced uh, that Australia was being targeted by a sophisticated state-based actor. So I'm not really aware that other country leaders have stood up and, and essentially the press conference was just to say, yes, we're being targeted. Um, so I think that was really two things. It was to try and deter the actor, um, which was China, um, although he didn't say so. And the other thing was to try and raise the priority of cybersecurity within Australia. Um, one of the other trends is that we've moved from a posture of never saying who was responsible ever and very carefully avoiding ever saying who was responsible to now we have done four times joint attributions with the US and the UK and a number of other countries. So Russia twice, the North Koreans once and China once. But we've also seem to have moved to a posture of what I call unofficial official attribution. So when the prime minister stood up and said it's a sophisticated state-based actor, there's not too many of them, uh, but I'm not going to say who, in newspapers the same day, uh, there were many officials off, uh, on background saying that, yes, it's China. Um, and so we've moved from a posture of never saying who it was ever in any form to now having quite a lot of backgrounding of journalists. So finally, takeaways. Um, disruption, I think, works. Uh, US Cyber Command has what they call um, uh, forward defense or uh, there's a different term which escapes me. Uh, but the fact that the Australian government is dedicating quite a large percentage of the current strategy to funding that makes me think that it works and it's, it's been worth investing in. Um, it's not clear to me that attribution has actually deterred anyone. In the US, I see uh, the Department of Justice continuing to issue indictments, which are one way of publicly naming uh, culprits. And that they're continuing seems to me to indicate that they're, they're not actually having much difference. Um, one thing, the field is evolving. Uh, the cyber affairs ambassador is now, now cyber affairs and critical technology. And I think that the, the sort of uh, the evolution of technology is becoming more and more important. And certainly I think of cyber in a very expansive way. It, it, it affects many aspects of technology. And the last takeaway, which I, I haven't really talked about, but um, our 2016 strategy was driven by a prime minister who really cared about cybersecurity. He uh, got deposed uh, and after that we lost a minister responsible for cybersecurity. So that role got wrapped up into our Minister of Home Affairs. And I think having someone who has sole responsibility for the topic is, is really important because it cuts across so many issues that if you're not trying to pull them all together, they just get left alone. And I think Australia's strategy drifted for a couple of years. Those are my takeaways. Tom, thanks. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Um, and you, you talked about in 2017 and um, 2020, how the ASD and the prime minister respectively um, made these statements, right? Um, and, and that was mostly designed to deter adversaries from, from doing these attacks. Um, how do you, has that been successful? Um, this naming and shaming or sort of naming and shaming um, and making, making those public statements as a way to deter? And how would you measure that success, you think? I think that measurement has been really poorly done in Australia. And so those particular announcements were designed, I believe, to deter criminals. And I just don't think that criminals pay that much attention to what the Australian government says. Uh, I think personally, they would have been a lot better off just doing it and not telling anyone. And the deterrence would come from the fact that criminals talk. They would eventually say, hey, something weird is going on whenever we're targeting Australian people. Um, 
you know, we just see bad, bad luck. That's weird. Let's go. We, we have better luck elsewhere. Uh, and making us a hard target through operations and actions would have been better than just, well, not just talking about it. I just don't think that talking about it um, helped that much. And I also think it, it encourages other countries to say, well, we've got people we consider uh, air quotes criminals in your country. So, it, it, you know, it's okay for us to attack them. And I think that was a, that's just a bad precedent. Thank you. I, I want to turn next to Elena. Um, you know, I, I, the Ambassador Bay um, from South Korea has mentioned, has talked about these layers, this multiple layers of, of protection. Um, and you've written several articles about the importance of ASEAN cooperation on cyber issues as one layer of it, uh, of protection. Um, can you talk about what specific actions the region is taking to build this cooperative infrastructure on cyber issues? Um, what's their relative success? Um, and are there two, three or four key lessons that we can derive from ASEAN's experience? Sure, thank you. I'm gonna to try to pack as much as I can in the few minutes that I have. Um, let me do that by offering four brief responses to your questions um, and then incorporating some takeaways from ASEAN's journey in the cyber realm so far. The first has to do with taking a step back. Um, ASEAN often gets a lot of short shrift for its painfully glacial pace of movement. Um, and it, that's warranted, that criticism is warranted sometimes. But it's also, in this case, important to step back and consider just how much ASEAN member states have collectively and <clears throat> excuse me, co cooperatively achieved vis-a-vis uh, -vis cyber issues over the past decade, especially given the diversity of the region. ASEAN was the first region in the developing world to adopt a harmonized legal framework for e-commerce. Uh, the drive for regional integration and desire to leverage cyberspace for economic growth in particular have over the years produced a number of master plans and plans of actions, frameworks related to ICTs, digital connectivity, and, and of late uh, smart cities network, uh, e-commerce, digital integration, personal data protection, so on and so forth. If you think about the differences in governance systems, technological skill, languages, as well as competing domestic priorities set against resource constraints in 10 different countries. It's pretty remarkable for this grouping to have come so far in such a short time. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Second point has to do with um, technical capacity. In order to secure this digital drive within the region, all 10 ASEAN member states have now established a computer emergency response team. Of course, the level of technical capacity and resources uh, varies among the countries, but the fact is that all 10 states have conducted incident drills together, some for over a decade. The most recent iteration of the ASEAN CERT drill was held early this month with an exercise to respond to malicious opportunistic campaigns on the back of COVID-19, so very timely and relevant. Um, eight of the 10 ASEAN member states are members of the Asia-Pacific uh, CERT. Um, and within ASEAN member states uh, and among themselves, public-private sector incident drills are regularly held. My third point has to do with policy capacity. Um, in 2018, led by Singapore as the ASEAN chair uh, that year, ASEAN member states agreed in principle to the 11 norms of responsible state behavior uh, that Ambassador Bay mentioned, that was laid out in the 2015 UN Group of Governmental Experts Consensus Report. ASEAN was the first regional body to do so. And this was a huge step, uh, given that only three of the 10 ASEAN member states have only ever participated in the UNGGE since its inception, and that many member states, um, indeed many states all over the world, are still struggling with even the idea of normative behavior, uh, let alone the application of international law in cyberspace. Beginning this year, ASEAN will work together with the United Nations to develop a norms implementation checklist so that member states can keep track of their implementation of these 11 norms um, as a demonstration of commitment to stability and cooperation in cyberspace. Now, reality check is my fourth point. There are still many, many gaps, of course, at the technical, policy, operational, and legal levels. The region uh, is a hotspot for cybercrime, given the steady rise in digital economic activity there, warranting greater attention to basic cyber hygiene at all levels, from the individual user to organizations and the government. 
There are also cross-border coordination and harmonization details to work through as connectivity projects involving uh, critical information infrastructure mushroom around the region. Uh, one example that I'm thinking of is the ASEAN power grid. Additionally, as the discussion rages on in international forums on how exactly international law will apply in specific situations in cyberspace, um, ASEAN member states would do well to seriously consider these issues individually as states and collectively as a regional grouping, taking into account the country's different legal traditions, historical context, and future interests in this fast evolving space, uh, including AI, the internet of everything and everybody. Uh, fifth and final point, um, is cooperation, cooperation with dialogue partners outside of the ASEAN region. Um, with the cooperation of regional partners such as Australia, Japan, the United States, and of course, uh, the Republic of Korea, these gaps that I mentioned will slowly be plugged. Um, South Korea's reputation as one of the world's most connected nations is ambassadorly mentioned, with a closely integrated digital economy is something that ASEAN member states aspires to. And the country's, uh, South Korea's new Southern policy should naturally pave the way for numerous opportunities for Southeast Asian countries to learn from its Northern neighbor and for both parties to exchange experiences with each other. Um, so in short, let me summarize it all with three words. The ASEAN cyber experience uh, so far has been one, developmental pragmatism, two, incrementalism, and three, cooperation. Thanks, Alina. Um, could, could you elaborate, um, if you can, um, you know, Ambassador Bay mentioned um, capacity building, right? Um, ASEAN is this, uh, you know, huge, uh, covers a huge part of the, of the world, um, 10 different countries, um, and their uh, cyber security practices and capacities and technologies are, are very different, right? Um, uh, can you just say a couple of words about um, what, you know, Singapore, for example, or other, you know, more technologically advanced countries are doing to boost the capacity of other countries that don't have that um, capacity on cybersecurity. Yeah, um, Singapore, as you rightly pointed out, has really taken the lead in the region to boost uh, capacity building. Um, together with the United Nations and other ASEAN dialogue partners, they've set up a number of capacity building programs and training. Um, and uh, some of that training has uh, consisted of partners outside of uh, the Asia Pacific region as well. So uh, for example, I and um, some colleagues from Africa have been involved in exchanging best practices with um, ASEAN officials in helping to understand what norms mean in effect and in practice and in Southeast Asia. And I'd just like to point out that actually uh, a lot of Southeast Asian countries don't uh, recognize this, but the 11 norms are already partly in practice. You just don't think of them in, in the norms framework um, terms. Um, and so um, uh, Singapore has pledged a, a lot of money for this. It actually boosted the funding for um, uh, Cyber Capacity Center of Excellence. Um, and I think together with these partners that I mentioned, we'll only continue to work more and more to increase capacity building at all levels, um, you know, technical, policy, legal, operational for the region. Thank you, Alina Noor. Um, I wanted to finally um, turn to Miho Matsubara um, to look at some of the private public partnerships. Um, can you provide one or two specific examples of successful government industry collaboration, including some of the challenges and obstacles and constraints um, and some key lessons that the US can reach and the region can draw from those examples? Sure, thank you. Uh, because that Irina already uh, gave us an example of the importance of uh, capacity building. So it's a great segue to talk about a Japanese industry-driven uh, public-private partnership to build uh, 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 cybersecurity professionals uh, capacity building. So, um, so this is a global challenge, not only in the United States, or Australia, or Malaysia, or Japan. And this is a global issue that we face an acute shortage of cybersecurity professionals because we are seeing the increasing amount of cyber attacks and the more sophisticated cyber attacks. And according to the ISC Square uh, Cybersecurity Workforce study uh, in 2019, the world uh, is was in short of uh, more than 4 million uh, cybersecurity professionals. And even in the US alone, uh, it was uh, like uh, 
almost 500,000 cybersecurity professionals was in short. So we have a huge gap to fill and it is even more serious in Japan because Japan is preparing for hosting the Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympic and Paralympic Games. Although that now we had to postpone this event till next summer due to this pandemic. So, uh, so back in uh, 2015, uh, major Japanese critical infrastructure companies, uh, namely uh, NTT, NEC Corporation, and Hitachi, decided to launch the cross sector forum to hire, uh, uh, retain, um, train, and uh, educate cybersecurity professionals in collaboration with in the government and academia. But to do that, the first task they need to tackle with was to find a global common language to communicate with each other. Because uh, these uh, members, uh, currently the forum has 43 uh, members um, as of today. And they are from uh, totally different critical infrastructure sectors like manufacturers, uh, transportation, uh, media, or chemical. So they obviously have totally different business practices, totally different expectation for cybersecurity. So they need to find, okay, so what is cybersecurity professional means? Because it can be anything, even though it's a really simple term to say cybersecurity professional, because when you talk about cybersecurity policy analyst at ASPI or Brookings, or if we talk about cybersecurity uh, network um, analyst at NTT, we are totally to talking about totally different uh, professions. So that's why they decided, okay, we really need to have a common language, but we need to go uh, to a global standard rather than the Japanese domestic one. Because first, all of the, the forum members have a global business presence, and also the 25% of the, the forum members are the Tokyo 2020 uh, partners. So they sort of, it's better to have a global common language to communicate with and also define what kind of cybersecurity missions they need to pursue and what kind of expectations for each type of cybersecurity profession uh, needs to have and what kind of skill set need to have at what kind of level of deepness they should have, it's better that because they can bring back their findings and discussions and best practices back to their subsidiaries, uh, not only in Japan, but also outside Japan. So they ultimately decided to choose the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States. Why? Because they only, because the NIST cybersecurity framework is not only for the United States, but it's a global standard. And B, uh, the Japanese government already provided the Japanese translation of this document. And the, uh, some of the forum members already back in 2015 were already familiar with the contents of the NIST cybersecurity framework. So they decided to go to the NIST cybersecurity framework to define, uh, okay, so what kind of cybersecurity missions Japanese critical infrastructure companies need to fulfill and what kind of uh, cybersecurity skill sets are needed to fulfill each type of profession at what kind of uh, level of deepness of uh, uh, understanding. For example, if you are C-suite, like chief information security officer, you are expected to know about some level of understanding on the legal issues, not only in Japan, but also in the United States, for instance. But if you are for instance, uh, like a database maintenance guy or engineer, you should know uh, some uh, level of understanding on legal issues, but not that as deep as the CISO should know about legal issues. So, so the, the, the forum decided to, to map out the different types of professions and uh, skill sets and the deepness as well understanding. And they also uh, map out the calendar to that, okay, so this type of cybersecurity profession needs to do this kind of task uh, between this month and this month. Although you cannot expect you know, when cyber attack will really happen, but then you have some routine tasks to do like uh, budgeting or auditing. And some of the forum members started to uh, sponsor uh, cybersecurity courses at different uh, Japanese universities 
And also they started to send their employees to those universities to share their hands-on uh, first-hand experiences to how to tackle with uh, cyber attacks with university and graduate, stu graduate students. And this type of uh, series of uh, efforts of the forum members started to lead to the invitation from the Japanese government uh, strategy committee meetings from different ministries and agencies to make sure to incorporate industry voices into policy making on how to develop cybersecurity talents. And uh, back in 2018, actually the Japanese national level of strategy and policy started to refer to the, the cross-sector forum name and also uh, publications to how to develop uh, cybersecurity professionals. But this kind of efforts have not been done without any bump. And of course it was on all sorts of trial and errors. Because um, first of all, it's a very old cliche, but an ambassador Bay also mentioned the importance of trust and confidence building. Because if you don't have trust with other members on the forum, you really don't want to talk about your own internal problems like breaches and what kind of cyber threat you're dealing with, with what kind of cyber defense you are uh, implementing. So it took uh, several months for the forum members to start to, to really feel comfortable to talk about their internal issues uh, with other members. And also they started to, to talk about uh, not only uh, how to develop uh, cybersecurity professionals, but also they also started to talk about uh, the how to deal with uh, cyber attacks and the cyber threat. And so to, to summarize and also to share uh, the, some best practices and lessons learned from this across sector forum uh, with other countries in the United States and Australia and Malaysia and other countries, uh, I think that uh, there are at least five actions to take to have a successful uh, public-private partnership or public-private and academic partnership. So first action you should take is to find a common language to, to make sure that you have uh, the effective and efficient communication with other members, because maybe your members have a different background or different expectations for cybersecurity. And second, you should make sure to meet up on a regular basis. You should have a routine. Otherwise, and because everybody on that kind of forum or uh, framework is really busy with their day-to-day -day work because there are always bad guys out there and you have to deal with tons of cyber attacks. So you have to really have uh, regular meetings. And the third task you should have is to make sure that you identify and prioritize at least now only a couple of important topics that everybody would agree to talk about. Everybody is interested in talking about. Otherwise, there will be no value to bring it back to the members employers. Because unless the senior leadership in the, each of the, the senior leadership on the, their company, they will not support you to go to uh, the forum meetings and then using their, their business hours to talk into your competitors. So make sure that you have some, some, something valuable to bring back to your organization. But it takes time because it, it, you need to take uh, time to, to make sure that you have a trust. And the fourth action you should take is find a couple of key people who are well respected uh, in your own uh, local community. Everybody will say that, yes, we really should listen to this person she's great and he's great to listen to. Otherwise, and, uh, it is really difficult because di different people have different opinions and different priorities. So if the key people said that, yes, I make sure to, to make my time available for you, to, to make sure to, to coordinate everybody's different concerns and priorities and interests so that we should make sure to prioritize our tasks to tackle with cyber attacks or uh, uh, capacity building. And the last but not least is to make sure to build a culture that the free riding is not acceptable. Because everybody wants to take advantage of this kind of public-private partnership or information sharing. Everybody would agree that yes, information sharing is important, 
but usually people just want to just take it out, not give it back to the community. So make sure that you, know, you have to bring it back to your own community or your own forum or the you know, public-private partnership, and everybody would speak up about their own experiences. However, I'd like to also mention about our original discussions on the COVID-19 pandemic impact on our daily lives and our research and work, because it is getting really difficult for us to, and also it's been really weird year for us to, to have a, not having the face-to-face -face meetings anymore. Uh, it's been really dairy to, to have that kind of meetings. And because cybersecurity professionals are kind of paranoia, to talk about sensitive issues with strangers, especially over online or the internet. So unless if you have a, some level of understanding or trust, it will be very difficult to have uh, meaningful discussions at any types of uh, public-private partnerships or public-private academia partnership on cybersecurity. Because cybersecurity is all about trust and it can be very sensitive. Thank you. Thanks, Miho. Um, I'm reminded uh, we had David, we had a conversation with David Ko, who was the chief of the Singapore Cybersecurity Agency. Um, and what he said was really, was really so appropriate. He said that, you know, most people know how to be secure in their own homes. You know, they lock their door uh, or they close their windows um, and they, and they have their keys with them at all times. So they know, so they, so they know how to be safe at home um, with their physical security. Um, but when it comes to cybersecurity, people don't know. And I think, you know, Elena and Miho, you've, you've talked about how training needs to be a part of, of uh, a, 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 this culture of, of cybersecurity and building it from the ground up. Um, so I wonder, um, you know, if I could, Miho, um, that, you know, when you talk about the common language, right, you, the common language, um, common set of requirements, um, how do you square the circle when you have diversity, when you have, you know, relative silos um, and, um, and, and you've brought up trust and Elena has brought up trust and I think Tom has brought up trust um, as well. These are very human emotions. These are very, you know, there's a psychology involved in all of that. Um, and so categorizing or kind of having a structured way of looking at security, the 11 norms, right, Alina, that you mentioned, uh, a checklist of whether what are the requirements, what sets of training, um, how do we how do we even start or how do we, um, can you tell us about those norms and can you, and Alina, welcome your comments too, those norms or that common language to, you know, to, to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. Yeah, so when you talk about uh, cybersecurity or cyber attacks to non-IT cybersecurity people, it is uh, always uh, better to, to bring up uh, some specific examples of damages caused by cyber attacks. And sometimes it, it's really difficult to, for people that we can uh, imagine about what kind of damages can be caused by cyber espionage because some people are really um, humble to think that well, we, we don't really have a secret information. It, it's, it's okay when nobody will attack us on by cyber attacks, but they don't just realize you know, how valuable information or assets they can have. So it's better to talk about something more specific and more visual like uh, ransomware attacks because it encrypts your data and it uh, holds your uh, business operations as hostage. So you can see what kind of damage is already caused by a specific ransomware attack. So if you show this example, like, hey, so this organization, like this hospital was attacked by uh, this ransomware attack. And actually uh, it already happened. And it was a really tragedy that now a female patient at 78 years old uh, in Dusseldorf was killed uh, due to uh, the delay of uh, her transfer to a different uh, uh, hospital after the ransomware attack uh, taken down uh, IT services at uh, the Dusseldorf uh, University Clinic. So this type of example is very really relevant, especially during this pandemic. We, we really need to have a 24 seven uh, access to uh, medical services. And if we do this type of precious and much needed access to critical infrastructure services, then people would say, yes, now I get it. 
we do need, need to have some security to, to make sure that we can access to this type of uh, operations. I don't know, Elena or Tom, if you had any follow-up comments on that. Uh, yeah, I'll just make a couple of points if I can. Um, I think this issue of trust uh, that Miho highlighted is an important one because it contributes to the creation of a common language. Um, and Jung, you mentioned that this is a human emotion and, and a sentiment that is cultivated, I think, through uh, regularized communication and meetings. You know, ASEAN is often criticized as being nothing but a talk shop, nothing more than a talk shop. But I think there is... Um, there's value in that talk shop in that it creates this predictability and stability of communication. ASEAN has over a thousand plus meetings a year, so it's sheer craziness. But at the same time, it creates this regularized schedule of meetings that instills this trust um, that can go towards making a common language creation much easier. Uh, second point that I'll mention is that the um, idea of putting forward cybersecurity strategies uh, from countries within ASEAN helps with this common language. So that um, at the very least, what you have is a comparison of these different strategies and plans. And then you can begin to discuss some of the terminology in there and what it means and whether these, uh, the understanding of these different terms can be merged into some sort of common understanding. Uh, look, so it's it's late in Australia. I, I'll just try and be a bit controversial at this point. Um, and I'm actually quite sceptical of norms, um, the way that they're talked about. So people often talk about norms as if they're the be all and end all of achieving cyber peace. And the problem I see is that you get to norms when there are actually punishments essentially for for transgressing them so um, I'm wearing you know a suit and a shirt um, if I'd turned up wearing nothing at all I, I wouldn't be on this panel anymore I, I'd have transgressed a norm and I would have been punished and I think with right now what I see is that cyber operations the the benefits outweigh the costs and people uh, will continue doing them and so of those 11 norms i think the ones um many of them everyone agrees to and we'll, we'll just do because they make sense and the ones that aren't agreed to the the the, co the benefits outweigh the costs and and they won't change um elena and miho spoke a lot about trust and um meetings and i think they're great so in the absence uh and I would describe them as confidence building measures is another term that people would use. And in the absence of an agreement on how to behave, at least being able to talk, um, I think is, is really worthwhile um, because that at least then you've got the chance or the likelihood that you'll avoid unintended mistakes. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that I really uh, appreciate about um, having voices from the experts from the region um, to talk about various issues um, is that, you know, not everything is about us, the U.S., um, you know, and, and so while the U.S. has come up um, every now and then um, in this conversation, um, you know, It'd be, it'd be great to get your perceptions or, or views and assessments from where you're sitting um, and the countries that you cover on how, what kind of role the US plays in either providing leadership or hampering cooperation or encouraging cooperation. Um, you know, if you could, you, if you could talk about, you know, what, how does the US fit into all of these efforts that you're talking about? I mean, these have been very multi-layered, regional, intra-regional, um, or national based. Um, so can you, you know, can you bring the US into this conversation and talk about from your from where you sit, how what kind of role the US should play or has been playing? Uh, maybe I can say, you know, start with Tom. Um, so when you started asking that question, the, the thing I immediately thought of was Huawei and ZTE and the recent uh, Clean Networks initiative. 
Um, so the background to that, and I didn't talk about this before, is that Australia first banned Huawei from our national broadband network back in 2012. So that was a fiber network that was being rolled out to much of Australia. Um, so we actually have a really long history of considering the security risks of um, Chinese vendors going way back. Um, but my observation was that when the US started to get involved, and I think this is a lot to do with the way the Trump administration behaves, it felt like uh, many countries in the region were feeling that their arms were being twisted. Um, and well, I mean, frankly, they don't like it. Um, and it seems to me that the Clean Networks Initiative um, is trying to achieve the right thing for the right reasons, but just in the wrong way. Um, and it seems to me to be too, um, too directing, trying to direct people rather than trying to convince them and bring them along. And I think the power of the United States has always been in the attractive power of the, um, you know, the, the beacon on the hill, the sort of American exceptionalism. Um, and when it's, it's just not, your administration is not being very attractive right now. <laughs> Um, so that's probably the uh, kindest way I can say it. So, I mean, let me follow up a little bit, um, Tom, in um, what are the consequences of that? What are the consequences of that kind of arm twisting? Um, what kind of position does that put Australia in? Um, and are, is there harm caused? Oh, there's definitely harm, yes. And I think it it's not irrecoverable, um, but it... Um, people have particularly around huawei have and chinese vendors it's kind of a cost versus some theoretical benefit and if people are not expressing that theoretical benefit in a way that really makes sense or in a way that's attractive that that, that pulls you in i guess uh i guess i would rather have a really good salesman rather than a really good arm twister <laughs> and um, the the administration right now seems to be more um, you know come with us or else uh, and I don't think I just don't think that that wins friends and influences people um, for Australia we're I think in a very difficult situation in that we've tried um, to balance our security partner the US with our biggest trading partner, which is the People's Republic of China. And that has really polarized that relationship uh, more so than it was before. And so we're facing a difficult problem where one of our biggest intelligence adversaries is also our biggest trading partner. And having the US be so um, anti China and anti-communist party makes it very difficult. And I don't think we've really figured out how to deal with that. Um, we, I mean, we're trying to build alliances with other countries in the region, I'm sure, but I'm not sure how well that's going. Alina, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm gonna take up Tom's challenge of being slightly provocative. And, and your question is certainly uh, quite provocative. So let me take up that challenge. I, I, I would agree with uh, what Tom said, but I would also add that um, there's a lot of talk about a rules-based order in cyberspace, uh, promoting the stability of cyberspace. And, and these are all principles that uh, small states, particularly in, uh, around the world, but um, in the ASEAN region adheres to and would like to see preserved because international law is supposed to be the equalizer of powers in theory, right? We all know that's not true in reality. But so far as it is a framework, um, you know, I think Tom mentioned um, the US's concepts of defend forward and persistent engagement. These ideas really push boundaries uh, quite literally because the idea of defending the US beyond its borders and um, 
moving into other countries' borders where necessary and as the U.S. sees fit really undermines this whole idea of not only stability and a rules-based order, but also trust. And it hampers capacity building efforts because then the question of the sincerity of the U.S. in, in lending support uh, becomes an issue. To what end? And countries in Southeast Asia are not naive. You know, we don't expect that, uh, you don't expect to free ride, as Miho said. We understand that there are very uh, realist interests at play. But at the same time, um, as Tom said, uh, countries don't want to be pushed in one direction or another. And um, to have these kinds of concepts floating around and, and practices in play makes it very difficult to come to an understanding of what a rules-based order means and whether it applies equally across the board. Leo, do you have any comments to follow up? Yes. So I, I think that the United States has been really relevant to this type of discussions uh, on the capacity building, uh, especially in the ASEAN countries uh, over the last uh, decade or so. So it is not only uh, unilateral efforts to help out ASEAN countries on the capacity building, but also it can be a bilateral. So I can give you some examples. So the United States has been really um, active to provide capacity building support for uh, ASEAN country government officials uh, on cybersecurity. And the, the, the US government has been also closely working with the Singaporean government to provide uh, uh, different types of capacity building uh, support, including cybersecurity. And I'm very pleased to, to see that uh, this uh, cybersecurity capacity building efforts have been uh, really uh, 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 getting a lot of attention and uh, actually not only act, um, attention but also actions uh, specific actions from different government uh, from Australia uh, in, uh, the UK and also Japan and sometimes under those uh, countries uh, do uh, bilateral efforts to, to coordinate uh, different types of uh, capacity building support for ASEAN countries. So I, I think this is a great to, to make sure that you know, to close the gap in terms of the acute shortage of cybersecurity professionals and also to have um, direct face-to-face -face, uh, conversation between the different countries to tackle with uh, cyber attacks and also to, to make sure to be uh, on the same page in terms of the how to prioritize our own cybersecurity. Because uh, as you said, and also the Ambassador Bay mentioned that the cybersecurity is a multi-facet uh, uh, issue, and we have different uh, priorities to deal with cybersecurity. So, so it's natural that uh, every country has a different opinions and priorities about cybersecurity. But uh, it is great that uh, not only the United States and Australia, but Japan, uh, have been, uh, Singapore, have been really closely working together to tackle with uh, cybersecurity and capacity building. Thank you. I, I want to ask one more question before I turn to uh, one or two audience questions. Um, I remember, you know, I used to work at the office of the director of national intelligence um, back when um, Jim Clapper was the DNI. Um, and I remember back in, I think it was 2013, um, when he said that, you know, when he, when cyber outranked everything else, all the other security threats to the United States. Um, and he specifically said, we're not looking at a Pearl Harbor type event. Um, and I was struck by how Ambassador Bay talked about, you know, the, the, this, the, that we should be prepared for this massive um, Pearl Harbor type of event in terms of this, this huge um, assault um, that, would be, that could lead to a conflict. Um, how much does that kind of scenario keep you up at night? Um, and, and if I could go back, to, go to one audience member's question, is it China or Russia? Um, this is coming from... Um, uh, uh, Gordon Johnson, a uh, member of our audience, um, is it, you know, when we, when you think about these massive potential cyber events that could lead to a conflict, are we looking at China or Russia? Um, okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, uh, does it keep me up at night? Um, mostly no. Um, so the um, the most compelling worry I've had said to me is that something happens by accident that is actually tremendously damaging, some sort of worm. Um, and I, I guess that is kind of similar to what NotPetya was like, uh, or perhaps the, the 
SQL Slammer or the Morris Worm back in the day. Um, and it's kind of the, no one, um, with the exception of the Russians, <laughs> no one deliberately releases things that spread like that. And uh, that's the whole point of why Australia talks about responsible behaviour and the US has been transparent about how they try and be proportionate and um, avoid collateral damage. Um, so mostly it doesn't keep me up at night. I think China also has, most of its efforts have been to try and promote China as central in, uh, in the world order. And so it, it would seem to be counterproductive to launch something that's just tremendously damaging uh, randomly. Um, I guess there's kind of offhand um, undesirable scenarios like a conflict over Taiwan that maybe change that calculus, but that that right now I would say that Russia more likely to do something kind of semi-deliberate accidentally uh, where they just don't pay enough attention. Um, China, not likely at all. So there's like a, there's a um, self-imposed constraint system, uh, this reputational risk um, that would prevent or constrain a, a, a nation state from um, some catastrophic um, incident or, or initiating a catastrophic incident? I think the problem with a catastrophic incident is that it results in catastrophic payback. Um, so the, if, if it were bad enough, people would respond in other ways. And I think both China and Russia, um, well, no one wants to escalate anything ever from cyberspace to anything else. Uh, but I think if people were pushed hard enough, they would. Uh, it, they'd have to be pushed really, really hard. Um, and, but I, I don't think, um, you know, the entire dynamic of, of why cyberspace is useful is that people don't escalate into other realms really at all. Um, so I think that there's kind of, that dynamic on one side and the other side, there's an incentive not to push people too far because you, you never know where that boundary actually is. Um, let me, we have just a couple of more minutes left. I wanna to turn to a question from the audience. Um, Albert Hong from Radio Free Asia. In case of North Korea, Tom, you mentioned this before, um, the hacker groups are secretly uh, working in foreign countries, but the countries seem unable to properly crack down. And Tom, you mentioned the idea of, you know, how do you, when is this a law enforcement issue and how do, where are the boundaries? Um, is there any, is there really any way to stop North Korean hacker groups activities? How is cooperation with the countries involved? Um, I, you know, maybe I'll direct this to Tom and then Alina. Um, it's a good question, uh, actually. I, I'm not 100% an expert on those, um, on why they survived. I think partly um, the, there's, it's, there's many North Korean hackers in the PRC, and I think that's partly because the PRC realizes that cutting them off would actually um, be perhaps too damaging for the regime. So there's, um, my take is that there's kind of a love-hate relationship with the regime in Pyongyang. And um, we, we like them more than the South Koreans on our border, but we don't like them too much. Um, and we don't want them to collapse. So they're, they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And it's kind of managing that as a, and I think cutting off their cyber capability might, might Lead, lend too much towards collapse, which is terrible for the Chinese. Um, I'm not so sure about the Malaysians. Perhaps Eleanor or, or Miho might have a better idea. So I know that there's North Koreans in Malaysia uh, as well. Yeah, I think, um, and, and this sort of goes back to Jung's earlier question about China and Russia as well. The threat perception in Southeast Asia is quite different from that um, elsewhere. There's no declared adversary um, and you know, countries in Southeast Asia, including mine in Malaysia, um, have diplomatic relations of some sort with uh, countries like North Korea. 
So um, I think that the threat is not so much from the outside as seen from within Southeast Asia because of the composition, the diversity and the multiculturalism of many countries in Southeast Asia, the threat really is from the inside out. Um, and we haven't touched on this very much during this discussion, but um, as I see it, content is a huge concern within Southeast Asia. And this idea of misinformation or disinformation campaigns in Southeast Asia that undermine the social fabric of countries in the region um, is seen as a much, much bigger threat than that uh, coming uh, emanating from other countries in, in other parts of the world. Thank you. Um, you know, as just to, to wrap up, um, you know, North Korea really uh, enjoys having a permissive environment um, and they use those diplomatic um, engagements and diplomatic relationships um, with, with, with uh, various countries, especially in Southeast Asia and, and China to, um, to launch their activities. And I think, Tom, you're right that, you know, I think it doesn't, from China's perspective, it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, you know, there's no, there's no lethal um, maneuver, um, but that, you know, it's a, it's, if it's a minor nuisance um, uh, from, from Beijing's perspective. Um, you know, we have run out of time. I just wanted to thank all of our speakers, especially Tom and Miho for staying up very late um, to have this conversation with us. And Elena, thank you so much and welcome to Washington. Um, thanks to all of you for your insights, um, to Ambassador Bay for, for his uh, insightful comments. So thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.